Hello, boys and girls. Welcome back to Let's Learn About Kingdom Come Deliverance. And today I will talk about the basic layout of a typical medieval village about pigeons and about bees. And right now I'm standing at the center of this village. And I believe this is a nucleated village, which is an unplanned uh, type of settlement, uh, which uh, usually comes uh, into existence around a uh, feature or landscape, um, landmark. And I believe this village came into existence around this part of uh, this river. I don't know why exactly, but it looks like this. Uh, and from there it spread out in the direction of uh, this road over here. And here we have uh, the village center, uh, square. Um, and we see a merchantman over there and with a market stand. And I don't believe it would be exactly legal uh, for him to uh, sell his goods here because he would have to go to a marketplace. And this here doesn't look like a marketplace to me. In the center or the core of the village, there are typically houses. And these houses uh, have uh, fenced in areas, uh, small or not so small gardens. And in those gardens, uh, the villagers would grow vegetables uh, for their own needs. And this would really be all in the village core. And after the cut, I will show you what's the next basic part of a typical medieval village. So the next part of the typical medieval village I want to talk about are, of course, fields, the farmland surrounding the village. And uh, the farmland would usually start right behind the houses and the gardens. And the typical field would uh, be a long, narrow strip, uh, as you can see over here. And you see there are three strips uh, separated by those fences. And uh, the separation be between those uh, strips could also be such um, uh, low stone walls, as you can see here. And those stones would uh, basically be uh, dug out of the field and uh, thrown at the um, side uh, by the farmers when they plowed and uh, turned those stones up. So there were either those uh, stone rows or very simple fences to separate the individual uh, plots of lands owned by different uh, farmers. And uh, the reason why those strips are pretty long but narrow is uh, efficiency. When you um, think about how you would plow with an ox or a horse in front of your plow, um, you would want to go for a long distance before you'd have to turn because turning takes time and is and this is time where you don't plow anything. So you would uh, want to minimize the turns and uh, maximize the time you could plow in a straight line. So long strips, very efficient, uh, squarish fields like this one up here, not so efficient. And those uh, strips would basically be uh, very close together and there wouldn't be any ways or roads in between them most of the time. Uh, so if I, let's say, my plot of land would be over here, a strip uh, going downhill, and I would go up this road, I would have to cross this field to get to my land. And of course, if there was a crop ready to be harvested or still growing on this field, my neighbor would probably be very ang angry with me. Uh, if I just trampled over there on a daily basis, maybe with my ox or my horse, um, because I want to plow. So uh, there was a compulsory crop rotation introduced and for every plot of land and every farmer and every type of crop, uh, there were uh, set dates um, when they were sowed and harvested and so that you wouldn't have to go over a field where still something was growing and also to prevent advantages for single farmers. Um, for example, you could decide as a farmer to harvest, um, let's say, a week early uh, while the prices for the crop uh, were still high on the market because there was demand 
but uh, not much um, wares on the market, not much uh, supply of this crop. Or uh, you might decide uh, to plant something else altogether, so a more profitable crop. And since villages often had to uh, consider um, paying their tithe uh, to their liege lord um, in or to their liege uh, in advance and would often pool their resources, uh, this might be uh, fatal to the village because when they couldn't uh, meet the uh, demands of their liege, um, there could be severe consequences, of course. And um, one funny <laughs> or curious uh, exemption from the compulsory crop rotation are fenced in uh, fields. So um, if your field was fenced in, there you would be exempt from or this field would be exempt from the compulsory crop rotation and of course you would want to f uh, fence in fields that would uh, be next to a pasture so that the uh, cattle wouldn't uh, go onto there and uh, just uh, graze your, your uh, plants uh, or trample them down and of course there were also rules for when uh, fences could be put up or had to be taken down and also, if a uh, field was harvested, there would uh, typically be stubble, and I can't show you because there isn't any in this game so far, because the season is simply wrong, I guess. And this stubble would become, uh, as soon as everything was harvested, uh, it would become a common uh, pasture. So everyone uh, who had uh, some, some sheep or some goats or some cattle uh, would uh, drive them onto there or at least was allowed to drive them onto there uh, to use. So if you missed your due date uh, for harvesting a certain plot of land as uh, you would have to do according to compulsory crop rotation, um, you would lose your uh, harvest because um, everyone was allowed when this date uh, was passed, everyone was allowed to drive their cattle onto this field or your plot of land and it didn't matter if you actually harvested or not. Uh, all that mattered was that you should have harvested by then. And that's really all about fields. And there is one more part, uh, one more um, large part uh, to a typical medieval village, which I will talk about in a second. The last important part, uh, but not the least important part, uh, of a typical medieval village I want to talk about uh, would be the common land. And the common land, as the name suggests, could be used by everyone. So the common land would include the village square, uh, the water flowing by the village, uh, the woods surrounding the village, and orchards, for example. And the use, the rights of use uh, for those, uh, for the common land would be proportional to the farmland owned by individual villagers. So, um, let's say I was the smith, um, maybe I would um, be granted rights of use uh, for this part of this rivulet over here or I could use the orchard for let's say a half a day per week and the water of course uh, was important because uh, you would uh, this would be where your livestock would drink where you would wash yourselves or your uh, clothes or you would um, gain drinking water from for yourself from and equally important uh, were the woods. The woods uh, would, uh, for example, provide uh, mushrooms, berries, or bees would be bred uh, in the woods. In autumn, uh, there would be the acorn mast, um, and, in, and you would uh, gather firewood for the winter. And uh, in the winter itself, you would um, go there to gather leaves and uh, for a slitter for the stable. So uh, the wood would uh, provide a large amount of really useful resources uh, for a village and the rivulet of course would provide water as I said. 
Um, uh, since the rights of use to the common land was proportional to the land you own, um, cottagers who basically owned no land but would live in a house in the village and help, uh, for example, as the, the smith or would uh, act as farmhands, um, they didn't own land, so they were not allowed to use the common land. Maybe they were allowed to use the marketplace to congregate congregate there, uh, but they weren't allowed to uh, take any fruit from the orchard, for example. And all of those uh, parts together, the village core, the common land and the farmland, would um, make up the march, uh, the whole area of the village, and the march would usually be um, marked by a natural uh, feature of the terrain. Uh, like a uh, rivulet, as we can see there, or a hill crest, uh, maybe even uh, something, um, or a wood, or um, artificial marks, which would be roads, or a marked tree, for example. Uh, this marked tree, uh, this tree there, uh, could um, serve as a mark to limit the march or uh, mark the boundary of the village's march. And um, roads, for example, were very common boundaries. And now we will talk about pigeons and bees after the next cut. I don't know about you, but when I see a pigeon coop uh, such as this one, I think uh, carrier pigeons. Yeah, sure. What else? And this is not entirely co correct for the setting of this game. Um, though there are at least five pigeon coops uh, throughout this village in this game, um, they were over there, for example, is another one. And they were not used to breed um, carrier pigeons, but uh, they were used to breed pigeons for uh, as, a so uh, as a food source. And carrier pigeons were uh, reintroduced to Europe by the Crusaders in the, th in the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, this is correct. And uh, because in the Middle East, uh, the tradition of using carrier pigeons has been kept alive. Um, and in Europe, it died uh, sometime after uh, the fall of ancient Rome and had been largely forgotten until the Crusaders came back with the idea and probably a set of uh, carrier pigeons. And but after that, even after that, they were only used uh, very in very limited circumstances. They were mainly used uh, during military campaigns and not for general uh, exchange of messages. So um, pigeons were bred as a delicacy, and there in the time of the game there was a large demand. Uh, for pigeons uh, by the nobles and uh, the better of um, townspeople. And in France, for example, in uh, 1312, uh, the breeding and uh, consum consumption, is that the right word? I believe it is. And um, was of pigeons was limited to nobility because there was a large demand and uh, very little supply. And one of the sources I used um, indicated that there was a pigeon trader in Prague uh, in 1397. So having pigeons here is perfectly reasonable for the game. And I don't know about the size of those pigeon coops or the number. I would imagine uh, if there was a pigeon breeder, there would be one larger coop, maybe, but I don't know about that. So, and the other um, very useful animal um, people would breed in medieval times were bees. And as we can see here, um, bees were in uh, times uh, prior to uh, the Middle Ages, were um, kept in hollow trees. So those were really wood bees. And, and people think, okay, nature, it's not perfect. Let's make it a little bit more perfect. So they cut out the hollowed out uh, blocks 
and would uh, put them on a little pedestal, uh, give uh, them a little roof, so that the bees would be kept dry uh, from the bottom of, and from the top. And they would also put a little pedestal in front of those um, hollowed out logs for the bees to land on. And we can actually see this here. There's quite a bit of activity. So um, there have also been uh, scabs in use. Uh, scabs are those uh, baskets uh, you might associate uh, with um, bee breeding or beekeeping. And they would be um, kept in bee bowls, which would be uh, recesses in the outside wall of houses or of a uh, wall surrounding the house. And you can often see those recesses which um, have a flat uh, bottom and a rounded uh, top. And today they are not used to store scabs in them, but to uh, put little statuettes or something in them or plants. But you can find them uh, quite commonly as an um, element of uh, decoration on a house. This concludes today's episode and I hope you enjoyed it despite me butchering your beautiful language at times and I would totally give you a potato for that but this game is so historically accurate that there aren't any potatoes, only apples in this game and I can't even blame Warhol Studios for that. So take my apology instead, I'm sorry and I hope you learned something new. I know I learned a lot when I did the research for this episode and I hope to see you in the next episode where I will talk about the two um, most common ways to construct houses in Bohemia at the start of the 15th century. And if you haven't done so, you might want to watch the first episode uh, of this series um, which uh, in, will, in which I talk about uh, the garments of the people and the dyeing process for those garments. And so I hope to see you um, in the next episode. And until then, have a nice time. Bye. <laughs>